Are you all sitting comfy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the next hour or so, or two, start throwing things. I just want to um, explain how I got into survival and then hopefully give you some survival tips and then we'll do the question and answers, okay? So you're all comfy? I shall begin. Okay, um, growing up in South East <laughs> London, the big bone of contention was national service. And we used to go to extraordinary lengths to escape the draft, making out we had flat feet, piles, nervous twitches, wearing shoes too small for us, anything to beat the draft. No one wanted to go to national service. Now, imagine my surprise when they stopped um, national service for people born September 1940. I was born October 1940. So all of a sudden, I missed, I didn't have to go. So the old uh, brain again saying, what am I missing? And I had a mate called Daisy, who was army barmy. All he wanted to do was join the paras. His brother was in the paras in the last war, captured at Arnhem. So Daisy wanted to join the army. And I was in bad trouble at home. Um, I joined up with Daisy into the parachute regiment. Um, he lasted two weeks and I lasted 28 years. So, <laughs> lessons learned. Okay, um, I joined the parachute regiment and I hated it. The physical side was excellent, loved all that, but the bullshit was absolutely um, incredible. They gave you pimply boots which you had to dry and flat with a hot spoon. They gave you a hairy shirt that you had to shave smooth. And the one that got me most of all was issued with a 303 Lee Anvil rifle. And you must never get that weapon wet. It's your man's best friend. You sleep with it in your, keep, in your sleeping bag. Keep it out of the rain. Swim a river. Keep it out of the water. Yet the first thing you've done when you got back to camp, you poured boiling water through it to clean it. So. This was too much for me, okay? So I'd done less than a year with the paras, and like I say, I didn't really like it. Couldn't go back home, I burnt me bridges. And I met a guy called Archie, who was on inter-tour leave from the SAS. The regiment was disbanded after the Second World War, but resurrected in Malaya in 1950 for the, uh, the Malay confrontation. Uh, fighting CTs, Chinese terrorists, who were trained by us in the war, armed by us, but then uh, typical terrorist activities, they're killing all the planters out there, like rubber tappers, um, blown up bridges, typical terrorist activities. So the regiment, the regiment was uh, re-resurrected to fight the uh, Chinese terrorists in Malaya. So in this country, no one had ever heard about the regiment. Now, Archie was on... Uh, into tour leave. Every three years they come back for a month's leave and they used to come through order shot on the way back. And I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to meet Archie who told me these weird and wonderful stories. I've realised now he's the biggest lying git I've ever met in my life. You know? <laughs> but he said, we go in the jungle months at a time, we don't wash, we don't shave, we come out with all this money and we spend it on wine, women and song, and then we go back in the jungle. I thought, this is a life for me, you know? <laughs> So I sent my sergeant major, I'd like to volunteer for the SAS, and he was delighted. He had the biggest smile on his face, and we parted the best of friends. <laughs> Needless to say, I burnt my bridges again, so I couldn't go back home, I couldn't go back to the paras, and at the age of 18, I passed selection. Everyone says how impossible it is, but if you want to do something, you will do it. It's only the people that fail that say it's impossible. And like I say, I found it easier than the parachute regiment because she was treated like a man. And to put it in perspective, when I turned up in selection, the sergeant called me Lofty. Well, I nearly died, you know, because in the paras, my mate got made up to a large corporal, and we went out that night to celebrate, and we got in a big scrap. The pub was wrecked, people went to hospital, and in the morning, it was all on parade, split lips, black eyes, and the sergeant major said, Lock, come here. And Joe's just been made up, went out in front, and he tore the stripe off his arm. And he said, you are a disgrace to the parachute regiment. And he said, look, we never start the fight. He said, I'm not on about the fight. He said, that's nothing. But you was out drinking with him, me, a private. And that was the difference, you know what I mean? So the, the discipline in the paras was completely different from the discipline in the SAS, which is self-discipline, probably the hardest of all disciplines, but um, it's up to yourself, okay? 
My first uh, training hop was in Malaya, right up on the uh, Thai border, an area called Grick. 9,000 foot high buckets or mountains, and uh, still a lot of bad guys. Even to this day, they're still there. And I'd done the training hop, you know, for my jungle, and I was late coming out to base camp before being deployed. Because on the way, we bumped into another, we was in pairs, I bumped into another uh, patrol who was Charlie Beckwith. I don't know if this name means anything to you, but he was the, the guy, American, who formed Delta Force, the equivalent of the regiment. They're the guys who went into Tehran to rescue the embassy. Are you familiar with this at all? Well, Charlie was so impressed when he was with us that when he went back to the States, he formed Delta Force. So we're going over a big rentis to um, the final exercise, and we bumped into Charlie, who was struggling. And he was 15 stones, big lad, and we finally got him out to uh, the base camp, and my troop had already deployed. And it's the first time in my life that I've seen 14 days worth of rations. On a bed, everything you need for 14 days was piled up and one of the lads said, look, this is what I would take, this is what I would leave. And it wasn't one of these sophisticated rations, it was all tins, an Australian type ration, and it's impossible to carry it all. And remember, you got your ammunition, radio batteries, got over a medical pack, demolition kit, essentials, and the only way you can adjust your weight is food. And so I looked at this big mountain of kit, I done what he said, and the means of cooking it, you know, uh, is a big pile. So I put it in my pack, and like I say, you can barely lift it. And I think this guy must have lived on fresh air, because it wasn't long until I ran out of grub. But luckily for me, Charlie Beckwith, who was going to give up smoking, eating, and he very nearly gave up breathing. Because after five days when we got deployed, he went down with leptospirosis because he didn't sterilise the water. He got scrub typhus because he slept on the floor and also malaria because he didn't take the precautions. So from 15 stones, he went down to less than eight. He's in a bad way. And I was rubbing my hands. I thought, when he gets Kazivac, I can have all his kit. <laughs> Big mistake. All he left me was a candle. No bigger than that. A bit of candle. And I thought, well... Um, we read of a night in the jungle, nothing moves at night, so you get a good night's sleep. But we use a candle to read by, so any flying insects goes into the candle, drops onto the floor. Whereas, like a lot of people, and you've all done it, I guess, torch, you've got your torch on, everything flies in, and in the jungle, everything bites, they're spiteful, they're thorny, and like I say, they sting. So you don't want them coming and dropping on you, so the candle. So that's all Charlie left me. So, <clears throat> after nine days, I run out of food. And I promised myself I'll never ever be hungry again. So I started taking a real good interest in survival. And one of the lads, he said, look, see that tree, you can eat it. It was a, a, a nibong, a palm tree about so circumference, real hard wood, about as high as this tent. He said, you can eat that. So I thought, great. So I attacked this tree with the last bit of energy I had, and the wood outside was like concrete, you know. But I carried on and was on a spur. And when the tree fell, it went straight down the hill. <laughs> so I went down the hill, and this is about 300 weights now, I got it on my shoulder, and I staggered it back on the top. I've used every bit of energy I've ever had. And my mate got the parang, he said, right, this is what you can eat. He went to the end, cut off that blend. I thought, that ain't bad. Then he started peeling it. Peeling it, peeling it. It was like a stick of celery. <laughs> and I thought, I nearly died to get this, you know. So I thought, you must have a bit of knowledge. Now, luckily enough, we had two E-bands. E-band is a tribe from Borneo, and each troop had two trackers. And these guys, every night they went hunting. And they come back with frogs, big frogs, snakes, monkeys, grubs, you name it, they come back with it. I become their best friend. And I went round there and I see what they was doing. They used to feed me. And so that was my interest in survival. And I thought, I'll never ever be hungry again. If I miss me breakfast now, I go giddy. Okay? So, knowledge. Um, thirst, years later, I was deployed in Africa in the NFD, Northern Frontier District, right up on the Somali border. 
real bad guys up there, the shifter, they used to come over the border, hamstring everything, the cattle, the locals. So we trained up um, a counter um, guerrilla force to combat this. And these were all locals. And we thought, because they're born there, they'll have a bit of discipline, you know, uh, living off the bush and also water discipline. And there's four of us who was training them and we was 20 miles from the roadhead and we had a jetty can of water to give them a top when they come through the checkpoint. The first team in, I was busy checking off their names and a guy, he picked up the jetty can and he drunk two thirds of it before we could wrestle it off him. What he couldn't drink, he spilled, and what he drunk, he spewed up. And there we were with very little water, with all these like recruits coming through, they had to have the water. We had to tab out 20 mile, and it don't seem far, but under the heat of the sun, never underestimated it. And there again, um, in this occasion, four of us, one of the lads had a small um, orange juice. I don't know where he got it from, but it's unique. So we all decided, you know, we'll urinate into the mess tin, mix it with this, and drink it. Two of us never, and we was in better condition than the two that did. Because it stands the reason, like your body's already refused it once, or passed it once, and it's full of all your waste. To re-introduce uh, it to the body is critical. Never do it. I'll, I'll mention all this later on, but these are lessons I learned early on. And I promised myself then, I'll never ever be thirsty again. Okay? So pretty well off, I've lived up to that. Okay, now survival, it's more a mental exercise than physical. Everyone can eat worms, it's great. <coughs> I do bird impressions, eat worms, you know, but basically it's 85% mental and only 15% physical. It might take great physical effort initially to get away from immediate danger, i.e. impending avalanche, forest fire, charging elephants, okay, or burning fuel to explode if the aircraft crashed or vehicle broken down. And so we always stay in the vicinity of the crash, okay? <coughs> um, I'm losing the thread again. <laughs> um, to know what to expect in a survival situation, again, will put us in good stead. You know, and like I say, a fight for the mind is all important. We can all judge how physically fit we are. We just got to lift weights or do a, a time run. But to know how mentally fit we are, th this is the key. Being strong mentally. And all life is a mental exercise. I, I, I'm sure you'll agree on this. And basically, it's never giving in, okay? Don't underestimate everything. Be prepared. You don't want no nagging doubts whatsoever. Now, people have done amazing feats of survival where people have died and they've been rescued, they survived, and then later on they've committed suicide. That's how fickle the mind can be. We must be very, very strong mentally. And this is what we try and teach when we do survival. All the physical stuff's great. We need to know that, obviously, knowledge. But we, what, we try and, um, what we try and sort of um, increase is the mental exercise, okay? It's all important. And again, you might find yourself in a tight situation and you think, if your mind is not straight, I'm being punished. I might have done a bad deed and you think this is punishment, you know. You must be very, very strong positively, you know. Don't have a passive outlook. Always, you're going to succeed, you're going to win. And you'll do this better with the more knowledge you've got, obviously, and knowing what to expect. So what I'll try and do is I'll run through all sort of aspects of survival, see how it affects us and see how we can train for it. You all understand it so far? Yeah. Yeah.